a lot of you tuned in this evening. This is perfect timing. Uh, because I wrote on Facebook and in Sonia's message that I had received over the last month some very powerful teaching about soul planning. This has been ongoing, my teaching, over the last month. So I've had to keep a chronological record of the teaching and the channeling, and I'm going to just get into it now. If you have Specific comments or questions, I'm going to ask Bev to follow them on the chat because I don't want to be distracted by that and lose my train of thought. But if something's not clear, Bev, interrupt me, okay? Okay. All right. So last month in this webinar, somebody asked the question about the soul's plan as it pertains to suicide. They specifically asked me, does a person plan to take their own life before they come here? I think I should back up for those of you who aren't familiar with soul planning. There have been a couple books on the subject that, and Sanaya has talked about soul planning, that before we come into a body, we do make certain choices, including our family members and certain circumstances that we will take on in this lifetime in order to learn the lessons our soul needs to learn in this lifetime, be it forgiveness or patience or compassion, major lessons, and there will be certain milestones. These kinds of, um, this kind of understanding about the soul planning before we take on a body is, is commonly accepted from those on the path that most of us are on now. But I have had a problem with certain parts of the soul plan, such as does a soul come here knowing they're going to murder someone? Sanaya very clearly answered that question when I was doing a retreat at Unity Village a couple years ago. I was standing on the stage, somebody raised their hand and asked that, and I allowed Sanaya instantly to just channel the answer, and it was a beautiful answer. On the spot, they said, the soul does not come back to murder. That is free will gone awry. Um, we may be able to somehow repost that answer, Bev, at some point so people can share that. But that was the gist of the message. But they had not specifically addressed, would someone come here planning to take their own life? I'm being told right now, it's good to preface this conversation with my understanding that the purpose of life in human form is to allow the soul to shine through, to develop our divinity. In other words, to get past the human drama, to realize who we are as beautiful shining lights, as souls, and to let that soul shine forth in every moment, to identify our fears, to identify where we're feeling like a victim, and to set that aside and let the soul shine through. That has been my understanding since I first met Sanaya back in 2010 when they started teaching me who we are and why we're here. We are souls in human form for just a while. By the way, so what I'm gonna share with you tonight goes against some of the things in a couple of the popular books that are out there about soul planning. And so, if it weren't for Sanaya really hitting me over the head in the last month, I might be a little more hesitant to share this, but I feel very confident they want me to share it because of what they said. And for that reason, I'm going to be reading a lot of their channeled words to you this evening. I shared them with Bev beforehand. I said, you think it's okay if I read this? And she, she wanted me to because she said that she could feel the energy when I read it to her. What I'd like to tell you all is anything that I share with you, because it goes against some of the things that have been written on books, in books, some things that other mediums have said, that you simply test it in your heart and see how it feels. It's interesting that Sanaya gave a message earlier this week about being the empty cup. Here's what they said. In fact, I wrote it down. Sanaya's message, you may disagree with another, remain open. Do not be so sure of your position, your opinion, that you miss opportunities to grow and expand in your understanding. Whilst in the human body, you will not have the whole picture. You can, however, do the best you can do. Be an empty cup, always with room to be filled. Listen to others' ideas and opinions and weigh them anew each moment, for life is ever ongoing and ever changing. 
It is not fixed, nor is it predetermined. There's a key. It is all about the evolution of the soul. If you stick to one position, then you are the one standing still. So this is challenging for me because I'm about to share an opinion, but that's why we're here and we play with them and I have to, and I'm going to do my best to not remain stuck in my own opinion. So simply feel how all of this feels in your heart and if it doesn't sit with you, great. But one little caveat is if you feel defensiveness stirring, there is always a lesson for you there. I get defensive from time to time and I hate that feeling, but boy, is it a teacher because I feel defensive. I want to defend something and I realize that's my human side. So be on alert for that. Otherwise, let's get on with it, huh? So when the person asked the question about suicide, I, I said, and you can go back to the video for last, from last month, I don't know because I've never asked, but I will ask and I'll have an answer for you next month. So here we are. What was really interesting is the author of a couple of those books on soul planning reached out to me the very next day asking me to, uh, to promote his work. And now I'm really being put on the spot because I have to have an opinion about this. So I asked Sanaya and I got an answer, which I'm going to share with you. In fact, the answer came from my guide, Boris, who is part of Sanaya. He's my main guide that helps me in readings. And as I got the answer, I said, Boris, you know I always ask for evidence. I need to know this answer did not come from me, from my subconscious mind, my own BS, my belief system, getting in the way. That is the biggest challenge for any medium, any channeler. And I said, I'm going to need a sign within the next two days. And if it shows up in my life, then I will really trust what you just gave me. And I, what came to my mind to ask for a sign, I instantly knew it was given to me by Boris because there was no reason for this random thing to pop in my mind. I was shown a silver medallion. I said, all right, I need a silver medallion in my life within the next 24 to 48 hours to trust this. Well, the next day I flew to England and my first leg of the flight was on Delta Airlines. I'm sitting there on the flight, a little bit bored. I pull out the magazine for Delta Airlines. I'm flying, leafing through the Delta Airlines magazine and it says, and if you sign up for our Sky Miles program with enough miles, you will be in our silver medallion club. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I didn't exactly get the silver medallion. That's kind of hard to produce a coin, but they gave me my silver medallion. So what did Boris say? I wasn't flying to England. I was flying to Minneapolis. I have to correct that. I was flying to Minneapolis on Delta to do my up close and personal spirit guides workshop with Suzanne Wilson, because I bounced this that Boris gave me off Suzanne Wilson. What do you think? Here's what Boris said about suicide. Do souls plan it in advance? And this is such a touchy subject. Please understand that I know this. I know many of you out there dearly, and I know that many of you have a loved one who took their own life. So know that I state this with the utmost compassion, only sharing what Boris gave me when I asked and gave me the sign that I could trust this. Test it in your heart. Morris says, souls come into this earthly life with several learning objectives that will add to the soul's growth. Souls often have more than one exit point. Some of you are familiar with that term. That means you may get in an accident, you may have a near-death experience or not, and you get to decide, am I going to come back and continue on in my human form or am I going to leave right now? And we have several of those. We don't, we can take it or not. It's up to the soul. Doris continued, due to the challenges inherent in certain life lessons, which are taken on through choosing certain family members in advance or certain physical challenges and so forth, there is awareness that there may be a greater than normal potential for the human aspect to choose to end their life experience when going through the toughest part of the particular curriculum they have chosen. But suicide is not part of the actual agreement. It is discussed and not recommended because they will not then master this particular soul's issue. 
This option is not planned or recommended, but it exists in potential. There is no judgment of those who take their own lives from those on the other side. They are treated as a parent who knew only unconditional love would treat their child if they decided to leave school. There is an awareness in the case of suicide of lost learning opportunities, a lack of continued soul's growth from that particular incarnation. And then Boris ended by saying, murder is a different scenario. This is free will gone awry, like anything that may result from humans losing sight of who they are and why they incarnate. Murder is always a possibility, but the soul does not deliberately make a contract for this. So I received all of that, and here I find myself in Minneapolis with Suzanne Wilson, a wonderful medium, a dear friend. I trust her connection with the spirit world implicitly, and I said, look, this is what I got in answer to does the soul deliberately plan to take their life when they come here. She said this was exactly her understanding that it is not planned, but it exists in a higher potential from souls who take on tougher life lessons. But she added another element to this that I found really interesting, and it really makes sense to me. It, notice how I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm touching my head. I'm touching my heart. It feels right in my heart. She said that those who successfully end their life by taking their life had an exit point right around there anyway. And if they didn't have an exit point, then their guardian angel would have stepped in, which explains why some people might get their stomach pumped out and they didn't succeed. Or some people might, put, I don't want to be too graphic, but their attempts perhaps to asphyxiate themselves. The, the hose might fall out of the car and it didn't work and they were found before they passed. They didn't have an exit point there. So... Just about everything I'm talking about for the rest of this evening, we won't know the answers till we get to the other side with absolute certainty. But there's the answer. Somebody asked it, and that one speaks to my heart. If it speaks to your heart, okay. If it doesn't, that's okay too. The bottom line to anything that we're speaking about the rest of this evening is what do we do as a result of that passing? What do we do? We know now I am absolutely sure from having connected with hundreds of souls whose human aspect took their own life. I've connected with hundreds of cases of suicide in my readings. Not a single one was burning in hell. Every one of them met with compassion and understanding and simply shown how they cut short opportunities for their life lessons. And then they continued with counseling on the other side and many of them move on from the counseling to help us here. But, uh, Again, the bottom line is then, all right, they're okay. What do we do as a result of that? How do we help our soul's growth? So it's not why did this happen, but what do we do? How do we bring more love into this world as a result of that? So the, let's see. All right. So that was the answer to suicide, but boy, the teaching did not end there. Uh, the author of the soul planning book sent me a couple copies and said, you know, I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'd like to know your opinion. Would you read my books? So they show up now a couple weeks later and I get them in the mail and I start reading them. And I had a problem. It was interesting that the chapter on suicide was very similar to what I just explained to you. So that was interesting. But there was a chapter about a woman who had been raped. And in the book, I don't want to bash the book at all, and I'm not. It's up to each of us to read the book and discern in our heart how we felt. But when I read that the understanding was a soul came here knowing if he would be the rapist, and the woman would be raped, that's where I felt the clenching in my solar plexus and in my heart. And that just did not resonate with me. Notice how you get out of the head and you feel that barometer in your own body. That's, when I'm, that's what I mean by test it in your heart. So the next day in meditation, I don't even know if I asked the question, but Brenda, my friend Brenda, who's only been gone about a month and a half, just is so present and she 
oh, did I ask? It says, here's the answer after I asked. So I must have asked. Okay. She just dictates in her voice, in her language, the answer to the question, does a soul come here with the specific case, knowing they're going to be a rapist? Here's her answer. Suzanne, we come to love each other. Being thrown into a human body is like being thrown into the lion's den. Do you like that analogy? It's because lions have been really huge with Brenda and me talking lately. She says it's pretty accurate. What there is, is the possibility of putting, being put into soul groups with people in various stages of awakening. This is key. Think about it, Brenda said. It just doesn't make sense. Stick to your guns, so to speak. In other words, Suzanne, if that doesn't feel right, you go ahead and share that. The soul comes to love. The soul comes from a place of love. You're not going to get your get out of jail free card if they know you're going to be a recidivist. You like that 50 cent word she said? That means a repeat offender? No, the soul comes to love, to be set free, not to go into bondage by raping or killing or maiming someone. Those are the lions and tigers and bears. Yes, the potential is there to do harm, and it's when a lower soul gets in with other lower souls that the free will does go awry. It really does. But that's why we need the brighter lights like you guys. Don't perpetuate myths. This is why I want you guys listening here on the webinar to go back and listen to this radio show on May 31st to see how I trust this woman talking to me. This was her voice and nothing had changed. She went on to say, people need a way to explain bad behavior. And the whole soul planning story is another myth when you go beyond the basics. I will tell you that you do plan your parents and your siblings and your race and your sex, that sort of thing, because of the opportunities. But seriously, why would you choose to come back and do something that's completely against the nature of God if these things happen naturally as a result of people who haven't yet awakened doing stupid human things. Wow. She goes on to say, God knows my family had enough dysfunction. I mean, come on, a little kid saying I am a poor and miserable sinner, that's learned behavior, not soul behavior. Of course, it's no coincidence that that's your message today from Sanaya. Rape and murder are human behaviors from souls who get so caught up in the story, they forget their original assignment, and that is to get down here and learn how to love. That's like a teacher saying, go in that math class and add two plus two until you get five. I love that. And Brenda was a teacher, and she's absolutely correct. Why are you going to be sent into this school to learn the wrong thing? It makes no sense. Don't buy into the myth. Things are bad enough without perpetuating lies. Stand for love, just like you always do. Be the teacher and keep knowing what you know. And then uh, I said to her, I know this is you, but for anybody who hears this breaching, Brenda, the Brenda teaching, I need some evidence. And she said, Rac raccoon, like Rocky Raccoon. Ask the Souls Awakening group. And this comes with this instant awareness of one member of the group that she started called Souls Awakening, who would know why she was talking about a raccoon. So I immediately posted what Brenda had said, what I just read to you. And I said, what's up with a raccoon? Who just had an interesting experience with a raccoon? And the exact the very first answer came from the person she showed me would know it. And then everybody else starts talking about this raccoon. Well, I wasn't, hadn't been on the internet yet. I had um, three hours behind everybody. And this was the day that that big story went viral about the raccoon that climbed the skyscraper in Minneapolis. It's everywhere raccoon. I thought that was beautiful. Just a nice piece of evidence that she knew what was going on. And what's really cool is that the raccoon story was kind of symbolic about climbing and keeping going higher and higher and higher and not being afraid and always looking up. And that's what those of us who know what our heart tells us do. We just keep trying our best to raise our consciousness higher and higher. So as a great add-on message that afternoon, Ty and I went for a hike. Where were we that day? 
Utah, outside Hill Air Force Base. We went up in this mountain. The hike started at 10,000 feet, so high altitude. And we were hiking for about two hours, and the trail came to a fork. And it wasn't marked. And we didn't have a trail map. Ty, the Boy Scout, is supposed to have the trail map, and he doesn't. Well, when I was in England, I came to a fork, and I clearly asked my team which way back to the hotel. I turned this way, and I got the clinch. I turned that way, and it was open. So I knew it was that way. I went that way and went right back to my hotel. So I said to Ty, I know how to know which way to go. Give me a second. I turned, I turned, I said, we're going this way. So we go this way, and we end up on the road that leads back to our car, not the trail. And it takes us a mile out of our way, and it's uphill at an 8% grade. A solid mile, I am getting more and more irritable. When I get tired, I get cranky, and sailor words come into my mind. I'm ready to kill Ty. I'm ready to beat him about the head and shoulders with my hiking stick. Of course, I'm just kidding, but I was really irritable. And all of a sudden, my guides are going, lesson, lesson, and I'm hearing ding, 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 which is Brenda's signal. And I said, what? And I tuned in, and here's the lesson. They deliberately sent me down the trail that they knew would get me home, but it was longer, it was more arduous. And they knew it would lead me to have to face some challenges. And I had a choice. <laughs> I could be really irritable and say to Ty, why the heck didn't you print out the trail map? I'm miserable out here. And I could have been really bitchy, but I held it in and I let it flow. And I said, he's as miserable as I am. Look at him huffing and puffing. And I chose the loving response. And they said, check in the block. You see, I was deliberately sent, just like souls are deliberately sent to earth school and put in certain circumstances knowing we're going to face a challenge. And I could have chosen to kill my husband. But I was not sent down the wrong way to kill anyone. I was sent for the opportunity to choose the loving answer. I was not real happy with my guides as we continued climbing the mountain, but I got the lesson. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense to you. A, a lot of these things I know I was told in advance by my team. There will be those of you out there, but will say there are a thousand yes, but, and what if we can pull hairs till our faces turn blue. I'm mixing metaphors here. We can ask the little nitpicky questions, but what if, but what if? These are global answers and uh, understanding that we're going for, and I can't answer each specific circumstance. I believe there are probably always exceptions to these stories if the greater good is going to be served by it, but as a whole, this is the teaching. So, Ah, and a friend of mine had an insight I wanted to share with you. You know, Sanaya and many spiritual teachers and sages have said over and over again that we're actors on a stage here, and we're acting out a script. I don't know that Sanaya's ever said we're acting out a script. We might have to check that, Bev. They definitely say we're actors on a stage, and we take on costumes. That's the human body. But the friend said... It, maybe it's not so scripted out. It's improv. And what's funny is the day before she sent me that, we walked by this theater and it was improv night. So I thought that was really timely. But that makes more sense because as I was discussing all of this soul planning with a colleague in this work, we were having a discussion about how much of this life is free will. And my understanding is free will is the wild card. Free will is the greatest teacher that we have. And this person's understanding with it was that even free will is not free, that it's all scripted out. And I just couldn't identify with that. That just didn't resonate. So the teaching continued. I asked Sanaya, give me greater understanding about how free will plays into this and how, how free will plays into soul planning. So just this past Sunday night, this is Tuesday, right? Just Sunday night, Ty and I get in bed. We had 
just turned the light out. My head just hit the pillow. I mean, I'm not even in that, that half in, half out stage when I felt this whoosh, like much greater than in a reading. And my whole body gave that jerk that happens when I start to channel Sanaya. And I remember saying aloud, whoa, someone just stepped in. And Ty heard me say it. And we had already said goodnight to each other. I always sleep with a pad of paper and pen. And I thought, oh, here we go. Poor Ty, I'm going to start writing right now. But I sensed, I could see in my mind's eye, a bearded older man. And he looked like somebody from the turn of the 20th century. That would be late 1800s, early 1900s. Very clearly, this gentleman was here. And here's what he said. I wrote it down. I took a picture of my notes. This drop-in, very powerful presence. We're always joking about people dropping into our bed. So we had a guy drop in on me. He said, about soul planning, God is love and you are that. Remember the teachings. Do not be swayed by popular sentiments. This is not a popularity contest. Life is about love. Do not denigrate the importance of the soul's mission by creating new feel-good stories that excuse ignorant behavior. And I said, who are you? And he said, William James. Now, I was familiar a little bit with William James because he's a spirit on the other side that Susie Smith, Gary Schwartz's mentor on the other side, had brought through in the past. And I knew that he was a teacher and a famous character. And I knew he lived around end of 1800s, early 1900s, but I didn't know too much about him. And I said to him, why do you care about this topic? I, when I write my notes, I, I write my questions so I remember. Why do you care about this topic? And he said very strongly, truth is my mission. See the Susie books, that's Susie Smith. William James, teacher, soul planning, contracts, bah. Now I know I'm talking to somebody from a different century because I certainly would never say bah. Do you feel, do you hear the difference in word choice and energy between Brenda's Chit chat and teaching, Boris is teaching, and this gentleman from the early 1900s. You are here to love. And he ended this very short visit by saying, Look up 1891, Professor William James. Well, for once, I wasn't so excited that I had to get out of bed and Google him. I just knew I'd written it down and I fell immediately to sleep. The next morning, before I even meditated, I pull up my iPad, sitting there in my meditation chair, and I Googled 1891 Professor William James. And it turns out he's one of the top, like the father of philosophy in the United States. He's a top philosopher and teacher. 1891 is the year Professor William James gave an address to the Yale Philosophical Club entitled The Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life. The wording of this, which I read after meditation, I was a little thrilled just to have that hit there because it seemed relevant. But I want to share with you a little bit of the wording from this big document that I printed out. I had a terrible time understanding his language. It was uh, very difficult, written in the language of the day. Um, but the first line, now remember, this is right after I'm asking about free will and soul planning and what is true. The first line of this 1891 document that he had me look up is, the main purpose of this paper is to show there is no such thing possible as an ethical philosophy dogmatically made up in advance. The moment one sentient being is made a part of the universe, there is a chance for goods and evils really to exist. And there is an inevitable tendency to slip into an assumption which ordinary men follow when they are disputing with one another about questions of good and bad. Does this blow any of you away? William James shows up to discuss this with me. And this is right on target after he gives me his 1891 professor, Google it. He says, but there is one unconditional commandment. This is straight out of the 1891 document. There is one unconditional commandment, and that is that we should seek incessantly 
to bring about the very largest total universe of good which we can see. He knows that he must vote always for the richer universe. And he ends it with this very poetic phrase. This whole document ends with this. I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Therefore, choose life. When this challenge comes to us, it is simply our total character that is on trial. Now, that doesn't tell us, yes, a soul would come here to murder or take their own life or to rape. But this is his shortcut through this document of getting me to the fact that this was the truth that he was searching for when he was here. I had not yet read this. I only saw the title that there was a document when I entered into meditation. This is just this past Sunday morning. I sit to meditate and here he is, the very same gentleman, William James, who I now absolutely trust is who was speaking to me and is who now. And he just about knocked me off his, my chair. He said, we who make up Sanaya, meaning he is one of them and has been all along, have quite a stake in your successful understanding of our messages. We have a keen interest in helping all of you to stay the course and understand who and what you are. And I ask him, have you been part of Sanaya for a while? And he replied, yes, of course, since you made your acquaintance with Susie Smith, my friend. She is a ringleader of sorts. I am a philosopher, which is why I am drawn to you. It is just that you would not believe until now. And this is the crazy part, because I've been channeling Sanaya since 2010, and I never asked because I knew that I, the Suzanne story, would never trust what I heard. I know that Jesus is part of the group from time to time. I know that Archangel Michael is part of the group from time to time. I know that Boris is always part of the group. And I know there's masculine and feminine members. But anybody that follows Sanaya's writings knows they're very philosophical and always about love. And he's the philosopher. Wow. He says, this is funny. Your friend Brenda is a good ally. She has much to learn as well. Trust her words about the soul's plan. We were feeding her. It is not that she became all wise immediately. Assure your friends. By resonance, she has been drawn into the group of teachers. So this uh, is funny because after I shared the breachings that Brenda gave about a soul coming back to commit rape or other things, she said, I just don't get why suddenly Brenda's so wise. <laughs> And William James directly addressed that. And I said to him, I am grateful beyond measure. And he said, we know this, we feel this, it is what draws us to you. And I asked him, what about the soul? And he said, this is William James, the soul lies beyond the level at which we commune with you. Yet we cannot do so without all of us tapping into the divine, into the higher aspects, at this we are quite deft. Spiritualism and its laws is what will save your world. I'm familiar with some of spiritualism's laws, the law of love, the law of balance. There are certain laws that are immutable no matter whether in the earthly plane or in the soul plane. And here's William James, before I've looked him up online at all, talking to me about spiritualism and its laws. Trust those laws. You live by them, not by breaking them with new philosophy. Man does not come to murder. We have told you this before, and you can trust us. Man does not come to rape and plunder. These are artifacts of lower souls, younger souls, as you understand them. And I said, I'm so pleased to make your acquaintance. And he said, as are we, it is time. I said, thank you for the evidence, the 1891 professor. And he tipped his hat, stroked his beard, and said, it is my pleasure as well, which I just loved because it was very interactive. And then he said, I will personally deliver today's message from the group. And those of you who may have read Sanaya's message on Sunday, I'll read it to you again now, knowing it came directly from William James. And Sanaya's message, which I posted, was this. Philosophy, is it not different for each person? You all must filter your ideas through your own set of beliefs. Each culture shares a similar philosophy, yet even within a culture, men's ideas differ. Have you not heard of the perennial philosophy? 
there is only one truth, and this truth bypasses the mind. It dwells within the heart, which has its own moral code, its own ethics, its own internal guidance. Have your philosophies, debate them, but worry not whether you are right or wrong. The heart will guide you. Follow its unerring guidance and live a life worth living. And when I read the 1891 moral treatise, that was the gist of the entire document. It's, it's kind of stunning, but it's not over yet. <laughs> so, in fact, the last line of that address states exactly what he said. The solving word is not in heaven, neither is it beyond the sea, meaning on earth. So the final solution is not found in heaven or on earth, but the word, as in, in the beginning was the word, is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest solve the debate. So there he is right there in this highfalutin language, which he spoke about in yesterday's message, I think, about guides. You know, the language may be highfalutin, but pressed it in your heart. There he is saying the same message. So we get on the road. I meditate first thing. How are we doing? Fine. Doing great. We get on the road and driving 300 miles that day. Ty did most of the driving, and I sit on the, in the passenger side and pull up William, William James in Wikipedia. And I learn, to my delight, there's a section there on his belief in and study of spiritualism and its laws, which is exactly what he was telling me in meditation earlier. And there's a section on free will, which was great. Because that was my big question, but he hadn't addressed it yet that morning. And right there in Wikipedia, he's the one that said, look me up on Wikipedia. Here it is. James says, William James says, the problem of free will is a very personal one, and that he cannot personally conceive of the universe of a place where murder must happen. Right there in Wikipedia. And then as I'm reading that, my lip twitches. No, it's always over here. My lip twitches, which is what happens when my guides are with me. And William James says, riding down the highway, we are reading over your shoulder and guiding you to these words. Uh, yeah, okay. So I read on in Wikipedia to read that William James combined the views of spiritualism and associationism, never heard of that, to create his own way of thinking. He used his line of reasoning to prove that our will is indeed free. And then it said, James was influenced by Emanuel Swedenborg. The moment I read that in Wikipedia, I got a massive triple lip twitch. And William James says, he is one of the Sanaya group. And I'm saying, Emmanuel Swedenborg? <laughs> so at this point, I'm so wide open. And we're riding down the bus, and Ty's not talking because he's always quiet. I said, this is perfect. I said, all right. I know very little about Emmanuel Swedenborg. Very little. I have not studied this man at all. I believe he's... Also a philosopher, but I don't know. But if you are part of Sanaya, then you must be here. Please step in. And in my mind's eye, got this image of a man very clearly, and he began speaking. So feel the difference in these words. This is a gentleman that lived, I can't even remember now, I think 1700s. So we're going back quite before William James. My dear girl, you are on the right track. I was an eminent scientist in my day, and of course, a philosopher. And I wrote down, he's showing me beakers and test tubes. He's looking at things at a cellular level and a soul level. And he says, are they not the same? I did have an intimate connection across the veil. It influenced my experiments, my discoveries, and my teachings greatly. I did espouse philosophy. I was born into a wealthy family. And I knew here that he's given me all kinds of evidence so that I could trust. I'm really talking and connecting with Emanuel Swedenborg. He says, yes, I am part of the group of teachers you have been told to call Sanaya. We can influence your mind greatly. This type of activity interested me greatly while here on earth. Free will, I did espouse this as well. You will find it on your internet. We do so appreciate these advanced tools you have at your disposal. 
I am credited with several inventions. And then he gave me something about bringing more light into the world. I was well ahead of my time, labeled a heretic by some, revered by others. Now do your research. We love you so. And I wrote that he feels wise, caring, and a bit humorous, even devilish. And he told me to specifically search his name, and he highlighted certain terms. Scientist, inventor, and heretic. And free will, four terms. So I went on Wikipedia, of course, and there it is. And I thought he was only a philosopher, but guess what? He's a big scientist and a huge inventor, way ahead of his time. Even invented something like a submarine and several other things. I tried to get a flying machine, imagine, back in the 1700s. He was also very clearly labeled a heretic after speaking of being visited by Jesus the Christ. Uh, let's see. He also came on to say the next day, if some of you read the message about guides, that do not base your understanding of your guides based on how they were in human life, that beliefs change once you get to the spirit world. So he clearly told me, don't even study his spiritual teachings back then. Just listen to him now, which I found was interesting. So I was quite surprised by all of this. I read it on Wikipedia and I said, well, I'm going to take advantage of him writing along with me right now. I have some more questions and some of you may as well. So we're getting to the end of this. I hope you're still with me. I asked him about soul planning in specific and I received an immediate answer. And here's what he said. The soul takes on the experience of human life for the experience it will provide to the soul. This is what's coming up now. One of the hugest you just, the biggest teachings of the evening. It was a real aha for me. About soul planning, do not think in human terms. That is a bottom up perspective. Humans know good and evil because you are immersed in this dualistic environment from day one. Think if you must think, better said, feel and know from the soul's perspective. What is the soul? A spark of the divine. Its source is unified, non-dualistic. Yes, the soul enters into a human body for the lessons the dualism will provide. But from the soul's perspective, it does so to practice being more of a soul. That was his emphasis. Not to practice being more of a human. Wow. You can only have this perspective if you see from the higher perspective. Do you see? Do you feel? He continued, the soul enters into human form knowing it will encounter challenges and difficulties and beings who have not awakened at all. Is this not challenge enough? Through these interactions, the soul must work to shine through, not to practice being human. You, the human, are an extension of the soul. You did not choose to do evil. You chose to remember your divine nature. See the world as the soul sees it, and you will no longer make choices of a human nature. He continues. If a human planned his or her life on earth, he might plan to be a murderer. You are thinking as a human script writer would sit at a table and plan a life, but souls are not human. Souls are above the human condition. Souls see the landscape into which they will be descending and choose circumstances that will allow them to grow by exposing their presence as a soul. You are here in human form to allow the light of the soul to burst forth. It does not do so through murder, rape, and mayhem. It does so by urging the human away from these choices. Remember my lesson on the trail with Ty. Contrast is inherent in the human condition of ignorance. It need not be planned. That's huge. Trust us in this. It is not punishment to take on a human form. The free will choices made by mankind are punishment enough. Whew. Wow. I really wanted this on video so you can go back and listen again. 
So I asked him, why are we getting different answers about soul planning through mediums? And he said, there are varying degrees of integration with the soul. That means blending with higher powers. And is this not what happens when one channels? You must first step into soul awareness, the top-down view of which I spoke previously. If you do not sufficiently rise above the human conditioning, you will bring that human conditioning with you into the material received during the transmissions. This is the filter of human consciousness of which you are aware. This is why you must test all channelings, even this, guys, even this, all supposed higher teachings in the heart, which is the bridge to the soul. It matters not if the channeler claims to be speaking to Jesus. The answer about pre-planning a rape came from a woman channeling Jesus. They may well be channeling Jesus, but still the human conditioning will be there. It is inherent in the human condition. As long as you, the channeler, have a brain and a body, these vibrations will be present unless you can get to the trance state when there is no human awareness or consciousness present in the channel, such as was the case with your Edgar Casey, a true prophet. You are not there yet, nor are most of your channelers. This condition is exceedingly rare. And then William James dropped in to tell me I will be going to deeper levels now that I trust them more. So I look forward to that, but I have some training to do. All right, so I said... So how can I trust these transmissions right here and the information you give me? And he said, this is why we have chosen you, for you ask for the evidence, and we are most happy to provide it. You did not know I was an inventor and a scientist. There is no coincidence that you have a close connection with two dear friends who were raised in the Lutheran condition, as was I, but it was my close encounter with Jesus the Christ that showed me a broader perspective and caused me to be labeled a heretic. Are you ready to be labeled the same? Stand your ground. Remain in the heart. We caution you to not be so adamant about your stance that you lose sight or feel of the heart's murmuring. That is where we reach you. Those who channel Christ, and you are one of them, must all bypass the filter. Just as your Bible was written by humans, it is not in its totality correct. The heart is the center of discernment. Keep what speaks to the heart, yet also allow reason to prevail. And I learned later that day that Swedenborg claims that Jesus came to him in a vision and tasked him to interpret the Bible. So even in his messages to me, there's evidence in there. And then he finished this up. He continued, this is why Professor James is part of the equation. Read his works and you will understand more that logic is inherent in the process as long as you keep the head and heart in balance. You have heard this before from Wolf's message. They sent me Wolf first. So I would learn the lesson of head and heart and all of us would remember, we've got to use logic. And that's where so many of the things that I've been studying about soul planning, I'm just keep saying, this just doesn't make sense. It's like a parent sending his child out to kill someone. It doesn't make sense. And then you get in the heart and you find that right balance. So the bottom line is we may not know truth till we get to the other side and it's okay. We're all works in progress. As long as we remember, why are we here? What is our soul's purpose? To blast through the human story, to shine our light, to fully embody the soul. This is your purpose in life, and we can do that in so many ways. And every time we get in a challenging situation, whether we're sent there by our guides or whether our free will got us there, we have an opportunity to choose a lesser option or to choose love. Like when somebody says on Facebook, something hurtful or hateful, we got a choice. Respond with love and it changes the whole situation. Whew, that was a lot, huh? A lot to take on board. 
Uh, so all I can tell you is I know they were there. I know that was real, but that was my experience. You all have your own guides. You all can tap into your own inner wisdom. We all do so at different levels, but I was clearly told to share that publicly, to stick to my guns, so to speak, uh, to stand for my current understanding and to label it as such. This is my current understanding because it speaks to my heart and I'm not gonna go out and, and become adamant about it all. I'm simply going to say for now, this is my understanding and I'll be open to changing it if anything changes. But I asked for evidence and I got it and so there it is. So just take it in your heart and I'm not telling you to believe it and I'm not uh, asking anything of you. I'm just sharing these beautiful experiences that happen because I asked and I trusted and I hope that you will learn to trust your guides and sit in the silence and ask what doesn't make sense. I'm hearing now.